Hey, welcome to Whatcha Doin' with Brandon Horwin and Sophie Williams. And today's special guest is... Hi there, my name is John Tracy Egan, and I'm an actor in New York. I worked um, I'm in uh, theater and film and television, uh, been in eight Broadway shows, many off-Broadway shows, and right now, I'm sitting in my house like the rest of you. <laughs> Well, welcome, John. We are psyched to have you on today. Thank you so much for joining us on What You Doing. Thank you for having me, you guys. Um, so, you know, our audiences are used to this this question being first because this I think it's a great introduction to you and um, basically what we're going to be talking about for the next some odd minutes. So can you tell us a little bit about your journey in theater? How did you get your start and sort of where it led you to today? Sure. I think, um, well, I, I grew up in Larchmont, New York, which is about 30 minutes out of the city by train, maybe 30, 40 minutes. And um, I grew up doing theater with my church, with my school. Um, we had a teen club, we would do plays and, you know, at school we would do musicals and things. And I just did community theater and wandered my way into the city and started going to auditions. And I think I would tell you that I learned a lot by just doing, you know, and just going to stuff. And, um, and I went to SUNY Purchase and studied voice uh, there um, to, to be an opera singer, but really didn't, um, didn't really take to opera as much as I really was a fan of musical theater and that genre. Um, and uh, I've just been lucky and stupid, I guess. People would say, you know, <laughs> why did you go into that audition? Well, I didn't know any better. So I went, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I got cast, you know. I think, honestly, I got my equity card. I went to an audition for uh, Big River uh, at an evening dinner theater, which is in Westchester, which is great, and um, where I grew up. And I remember going in going, well, I'm not really, I'm not really, I don't look like one of the boys and I'm too young to be one of the old guys. So I'm probably not gonna get it, but it's just good to practice. And of course I got it. I was covering a couple of the older guys and I played Judge Thatcher and, you know, but I was the same age as the, the boys. I just looked older because you know, <laughs> I'm a bigger guy. <laughs> Well, that's great. I mean, it, you know, you've had such a diverse and, and incredible career in some really noteworthy shows that we're going to talk about today. So it's really fun to hear how you got your start. Yeah. So uh, your early, you know, Broadway, off-Broadway career consisted of credits like uh, Jekyll and Hyde by Frank Wildhorn and Bat Boy by Lawrence O'Keefe. Specifically, you know, both shows that are just loved by theater fanatics and have an awesome fan base, but they aren't typically produced. You know, how was that experience at the very beginning of your professional career? Well, you know, Jekyll and Hyde had been around for a long time. Yeah. Jekyll and Hyde was a concept album, and then it was a second concept album. And um, actually, I have kind of an interesting story about auditioning for that. Uh, it was a national tour. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it had played at the Alley Theater um, in Texas. And it, it was working its way to Broadway for our, a very, very long time. And I, again, sort of tripped into that um, in the fact that Christine Petty and I are very good friends. I'm probably, you know, Christine Petty from Sirius yeah. Satellite Ready. We're, we've been satellite ra radio ready. No, um, <laughs> but uh, we're very good friends. We, we did community theater together and she was doing Forbidden Broadway or Forbidden Hollywood out in Los Angeles. And she was cast on the recording of the second uh, recording of Jekyll and Hyde, the, the, the double album with Anthony Warlow. And um, when they were having auditions, she said, you should audition for this. Frank Wildhorn would really like you. He would like your voice. And I, so she said, call, hit, call Frank's uh, secretary. So I called Frank's secretary and she got me an audition because I couldn't get an audition appointment myself at that time. Um, I was on a national tour of Cats actually at the time mm -hmm. and we found out that I couldn't audition. So, because I was, my contract wouldn't allow me. It came around again and the secretary's name is Martha Ashton, a lovely person. She's not a secretary anymore, but great lady. Called her up and I said, Martha, they're having an audition for, um, for the tour. Could I get an audition? Sure, John, get you an audition. She got me an audition and they heard me and put me on a list to replace because it had already been cast. So I replaced um, 
uh, two people on the tour. And when the new director came, he wasn't going to be the director for Broadway. I was in the cast when he saw me both times and not everybody got kept, unfortunately, um, for the Broadway company, but I did. And I have to say, it's, you know, it, I take it down to Christine. I always tell Christine, you, you're never paying for a meal whenever we go out together because, you know, you got me my first Broadway show. But it's kind of like, you know, it's interesting. You know, it's, you go through knowing people um, and, you know, people do uh, want to know about you. Um, Susan Stroman, when I went to the producers, she did a background check. She likes to know who these people are. Do you like them? Are they easy to work with? Blah, blah, blah. Um, the quick note about Bat Boy, which it is, I was, uh, I understood the, the, the four adults. It was right when Jekyll and Hyde closed. Um, and uh, Larry O'Keefe, I was in Evita <laughs> with Christine Petty at the Chappaqua Drama Group. And Larry O'Keefe saw me as a kid and his brother. And when I auditioned for um, Bat Boy, he was already a fan. <laughs> You know, and I was doing community theater. So he was like, oh, you know, oh, I remember me from, I, I saw you in Evita and you're amazing, blah, blah. But, you know, it was quite a big, quite a big jump. I think it was from, I think it was in Evita in 85 and um, Bat Boy was 2001. So 15 years later, Larry Keefe's like, I want John to do it. So I ended up doing uh, Bat Boy for a bunch of months. And uh, that was a really fun experience, I have to say. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a really, um helpful story to not just me but like our audiences and how uh, the process to a job you know how long it it may or may not take right and people people like you know you always hear these people people like working with their friends yeah so you know if you're uh, hopefully I have been I mean I've had my moments uh, where you you're a fun company member you're a nice company member you're somebody people like to be around and, and work with um you know, they're going to invite you to be a part of their projects if they, if they have a space for you, which is, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so going off of that, you also appeared in the concert of chess uh, with Josh Groban produced by the Actors Fund. Right. So how does uh, a rehearsed process for a concert differ from, you know, a fully realized musical? That was a, well, that was a massive project. Um, yeah. It was directed by Peter Flynn and Seth Rudetsky uh, cast me. Uh, asked me to be a part of it because he was in charge of those concerts. And um, we rehearsed it, uh, every, there, you know, people were in other shows. I think I was in the producers at the time. So you're rehearsing during the day and you're going to do a show at night. And it's a scheduling nightmare for those people who are putting it together, but it had a massive uh, chorus or, or a choir, had a massive choir. Then it had all the performers um, and then you had a huge orchestra and then you had dancers, Christopher Gatelli, who I had been in Cats with on tour, was the choreographer for that before his notoriety today as being a Tony winning choreographer. Um, he choreographed the, all the numbers. So it's a lot like um, rehearsing a Broadway show, except that, you know, it's not a 10 to six or nine to, it's never nine to five, 10 to six rehearsal period. You know, people are coming in when they can come in. And again, a lot of, it's all volunteer. You know, the actors, everybody's volunteering, the stage managers, everybody. And it's a lot of work for the stage managers, not to mention the, the you know, the directors and the music directors and all. It's a lot of work, um, but it's a very important um, program to make money for Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS. And you know, they've done wonderful things. The, the Dream Girls concert, I think one of the, my favorite things I ever saw was on the 20th century with um, Doug Sills and Mary Maisie, Chris Sieber. It was fantastic. It should have just gone right to a theater. It was just <laughs> amazing. Um, but chess was exciting. And again, I, I love the score to chess. Who doesn't? Um, tell you a funny story, our, our, our producer of uh, the producers, we went the after party afterwards. He came in, he came up to me and he said, that was so thrilling. What an amazing evening. And just the music and everything was fantastic. What did I just see? What was that about? <laughs> I mean, it's like everybody loves chess, but it's very hard to make chess work, I guess, yeah. um, you know, through the years. So I think, you know, people were looking at it going, oh, 
we gotta move this to Broadway, we're gonna make a fortune, except, you know, it's just a strange show that's been done in so many versions, you know, like yeah. they've done re rearranged it. I saw a really great version of it that was set in, um, it was set in like the Middle East. So instead of Russia, it was sort of a modern version where it was called a brand new Baghdad instead of one night in Bangkok. And it was, it really worked. I thought like they should bring this version in because this version's, you know, it makes sense and it's, you know, it's topical. Um, really, really good. Yeah. Also like chess, like what a rare opportunity to, you know, be in a show that like, like you said, like notoriously cannot, you know, it doesn't work the best. Right. Yeah. It doesn't work the best, but it's a great score. Oh my gosh. I, I got to play Anatoly at the Tropical Drama Group, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> where Christine Penny and I appeared in Evita. Um, and it was just, like a thrilling score to sing I it, I have to say you know it's just one of my favorites I wish I could do it again yeah awesome well you've also had quite the tenure in the hit show the producers from 2002 to 2007 is that correct that's correct and so you were probably among one of the only actors to play all the principal roles in that show that <laughs> I think probably to be, uh, I would say, I think there was another actor who, who got a chance to play them all, but I was contracted to play them as separate contracts. So I was uh, Franz Liebkin first, then I was Roger Debris, then I went back to Franz Liebkin, and then I went to Max Bialystok. While I was Franz Liebkin, I covered the other two. I, I covered uh, uh, Roger Debris and Max Bialystok. So through the five years, I mean, what a great uh, show to be in and three great parts. I mean, a job you'd never want to leave because, you know, one day you get to play a different part in the, you know, and I know everybody's lines. <laughs> <laughs> it comes in handy. <laughs> now, you also were in the film version with Matthew Broderick and Nathan Lane. Is that correct? I was. So, if you sneeze, so you'll miss me. <laughs> but I did get a feature. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Susan. <laughs> So do you, you know, how did, did your journey with that show kind of um, continue? Did, you know, obviously you love that show, but um, you know, how, what, how did you work your way through the, the years of production and then into the film? Okay, you guys, this could, this would be a book I should write because really <laughs> the story from like auditioning to bouncing around, I mean, there's so many uh, uh, factors to it. Um, working my way into the film was the easy part because I was in the Broadway production and Susan Stroman was so generous to make sure that people who are connected with the show on tour, on Broadway, you know, got a piece of it, got to be in a little bit of it um, here and there. And so, you know, they would basically look at this movie schedule and say, okay, we need him for this time can he be out of the show for this time? You know, and I, I don't think I missed any performances. I, I'm wondering if I did or, or not. I don't remember um, whoever I was playing um, at the time, uh, but I think I may have done it, you know, on the off hours, but uh, it was the, um, the opening number, opening night, it's opening night, that whole, so I'm in that section. And then I'm in another section, um, where it's the second opening night where we're just kind of walking by and, and being people who go to the theater. Um, so again, that was the easy part. Um, we recorded the soundtrack separately and we went and we did our, you know, the people who got to shoot their, their scene, which was really fun. And um, then they had a really great, like a fun sort of premiere for us where they invited all the casts to an AMC. I think it was like on the Lower East Side and they showed it in like five theaters and everybody came and, you know, we sort of came as a big cast and watched it, um, which was really kind of fun. But, you know, the other stuff was just wacky, the, the, the different parts I played and how I got to play the different parts and who I got to play them with and was just amazing. I mean, that was uh, great, uh, really a, a highlight. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the producers uh, won 12 Tony Awards. So that's like the most in, in musical theater history at this point. So how would you say that affected the show, affected you, you know, in the moment of being in the show? And then how would you say the producers 
experience for you and your years with it as a whole affected your career going forward? Well, I think um, how it affected it was that it made it a juggernaut. People wanted to see it. Um, and um, uh, the tricky thing I think was when it, when we came to the years of, you know, year three, year four, because it was so difficult to get into, people didn't realize they could get tickets when they could. And so they would, you know, kind of look at it like, oh, I can't get tickets to that, I'll go to something else. And, you know, I many times I had people ask for, um, you know, can I, can I get your house seats and things like that, which I was, you know, fine to do. As a matter of fact, the second time I had, um, when Nathan, I wasn't in the show with Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick in the beginning. So I didn't come in until a year later when they left. They came back a year after that and Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick were in the show. And so they were in for three months. And of course the phone was ringing people constantly asking me, can I have house seats? Can I have house seats? And so I did this thing called Ticket Bastard. You know, for Ticket Master, I was Ticket Bastard. I was like, you had to email me your, uh, what you wa wanted. You had to send me a check for $25 per ticket made out to Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS. Because this is a pain in the neck. When, peop when people want tickets to your show and you're in a hot show and you're the one kind of dealing with it, you become a ticket broker as well as an actor. <laughs> so people would, you know, I would go, well, I got Thursday free, I got Friday free, you know, I got whatever. And, but I'm like, I'm gonna charge you. I'm gonna, I want $25 extra for the ticket. It's gonna go to Broadway Cares. And Gary Beach loved that idea. He did the same thing. So he, we both be, you know, became a ticket bastard. And, you know, you got, you know, we made 50 bucks per, per, couple for Bobby Cares, which was really kind of fun. Um, the show was a huge uh, a thing for me because, it, well, first of all, it was the first time I was um, a principal on Broadway. My first principal role was Franz Lipkin. Then, I mean, there were my first three principal roles. Then I was um, Max Bialystok and my name was above the title on the marquee and in the New York Times, which was huge and, and super, super exciting. Um, and uh, I've been able to do the producers a couple of more times since. I've played Franz, I did Franz at Paper Mill Playhouse and I've played Max Bialystok at, at Pittsburgh Civic Light and uh, Casa Manana two summers ago. Oh, we froze, there we are. Um, and I would do it tomorrow. Like if anybody, you know, called me and said, you wanna play Max Bialystok? I would do it tomorrow. It's my it's my favorite role. It's so much fun to do. Um, so, it, you know, uh, nothing will, can replace that experience. I mean, it was huge. Absolutely. I mean, it is, you know, it's, it's one of those shows where it has to be just as fun to perform as it is to watch. So much fun. And the, and the lunacy of some of the actors I worked with, you know, besides Nathan and Matthew, which were so fun. I remember the first time I played, I was Franz when they came in, when they came back. And the first time I went on as Roger Debris, they were both laughing. Like they couldn't do the scene because Matthew just kept laughing. And Nathan was, you know, improv and saying, I love the way your chest hair accents your jewelry, Roger, you know, and just all that kind of craziness. And, you know, Stephen Weber and Richard Kind and all these, Hunter Foster and Roger Bart, I mean, could destroy me any, he was the one who could destroy me. I'll tell you, he could, <laughs> you know, he, he just had to give me a look and I would be gone. And Brooks Ashmanskis, Jonathan Freeman is one of my dearest friends. Those two, I mean, forget it. So <laughs> the play got longer. <laughs> the play got longer, the more they make me laugh. <laughs> Great. Um, You've also acted in films like The Last Night with Keira Knightley and Eva Mendes, as well as TV, 30 Rock, Law and Order, As the World Turns. So what do you think the benefits are of being a stage actor, but expanding your career um, onto the screen? And are there any challenges or drawbacks to it as well? There are a lot of challenges. I think the challenges are, you know, um, knowing how to, you know, hit your mark and it's a, it's a different, you know, the style of the show you're in, sometimes the style of the television show dictates, you know, how your performance has to play out. Um, it's a, of course, it's a great way, I mean, to, uh, to live on and, 
and make uh, make um, residuals. I mean, I, I still think that my Law and Order episode uh, is probably the thing that pays me the best. Since I mean, maybe Gotham, but um, or uh, but you know, some of these shows. I mean, they just keep playing and playing and playing, and uh, you know, and then you just keep getting paid not a ton of money, but you know, lunch, you know. <laughs> Um, but it's, you know, everybody wants to be, I think every, every stage actor will tell you that, you know, that they would love to do television. They would love to do movies. And, um, when we get a chance, it's, it's great, you know? Um, so I'm grateful for all those opportunities. Yeah. So you've done like a lot of original work, you know, Bat Boy, Sister Act, uh, Jekyll and Hyde, Little Mermaid, but you've also done a lot of work in revivals, like, Kiss Me Kate and Oliver and Bye Bye Birdie and My Fair Lady. So how were those experiences and what is your, you know, personal preference as a performer? Oh, that's a really cool question. I would say, um, uh, you know, the, th the thing about the revivals is that there is a, um, there's a map, there's a floor map. You, they know it works. It's been worked in the past and you could follow that floor map or you could, director could decide to try something completely different. Um, with it, um, but in some ways the musical has a little bit of a sure thing connected to it. Doesn't necessarily mean it will be a hit, but you know it has. It's been proven. Um, the original stuff is trickier because a lot of new things can be thrown at you every day while you're in um, uh, uh, previews. Uh, rehearsals, one thing we do rehearsal, you change that up. But then when you forget in front of an audience, uh, as the great Jerry Zaks, I'm such a fan of Jerry Zaks, would say, now our work begins. After the first preview, he, he says to the cast, now our work begins because now we have to make the show run and work. And we see it in front of an audience and we know how things go together. And there was a scene in Sister Act, there's a bar scene in Sister Act with the three guys looking for Dolores. And that changed nightly for <laughs> two weeks where I had all the lines and they were not easy lines to I had less lines by the end, which <laughs> made me very happy, trust me. Um, so that was one thing. And then the nuns learned a song in one day and a brand new song. Um, I think it's, it's not on the CD, it wasn't recorded. Um, it goes, it goes in place of um, the, is it the calling? I think it's the calling on the sea. I don't know. Cause I don't, I, I don't have it. Cause I'm not on it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they replaced it with, it's good to be a nun. I think it is, which is more sort of like a recitative kind of song rather than a, um, and that was an interesting uh, process because the calling, if you listen to the CD, the, 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 the nuns all sing beautifully, but they haven't been taught to sing yet. So in the story, which was Jerry Zaks's concept, we, the nuns can't sing yet. So they shouldn't sing yet. We shouldn't hear them sing until they sing. And by the way, he got them to sing like within like, I don't know, 14 minutes in the play or something, you know, he really tightened it up. So we replaced it with a song where then, where they sort of uh, speak the song, speak sing. And, um, and some people go, well, it's not as good of a song. Well, it's, it's better for the show, it makes the show make more sense. Um, but if you're a fan of, you know, there are those fans out there who, who don't like when songs are cut. If you're going to do baby, <laughs> you've got to sing patterns. Why did they cut patterns? <laughs> I always say that. I go, you probably love patterns, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason they cut patterns. <laughs> the show was too long. No, I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, so that's the process of something new is that, you know, stuff can change all the time. And, and sadly, sometimes your part can get cut. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I believe I heard in the producers is if you know the movie, the, the, the lady on the stoop, Boyd, see his Boyd's upstairs, the, the landlord lady, when they go to see Franz, they tried to put that in the show and they tried it with different actresses and different writing and they just went, it's just slowing us down. We're gonna have to cut it. I know people love it in the movie, but we're just gonna cut it from today's show, so. Yeah, I mean, hey, that's, that's um, you know, it's about tightening it up and what works in the moment. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Um, that's great. So, John, where were you prior to the COVID shutdown? And, um, 
you know, what have you been working on since? Have you been able to, uh, you know, sort of adapt to the online format? And, um, you know, where have you been, you know, these past several months? I had, uh, February 23rd, we closed Clue um, at the Cleveland Playhouse. And Clue was supposed to open again at the uh, Paper Mill Playhouse. I believe it was the fall of last year. Um, I had... I was supposed to do Bye Bye Birdie at the Kennedy Center. And I, I had tickets to that for my, Did birthday, you? For my 21st <laughs> birthday. I had tickets. I remember you buying those. <laughs> I bought them like the day they came out. It's my dad's favorite show and it was going to be a family. I went with you to buy them. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's so funny. Yeah. So Brandon, I'm sure it'll come back. It'll probably be next year. Do you know what I mean? I feel like every job that got canceled is just going to come back in a couple of years later. That's all, you know, it, so, but I had that and then a couple of other things um, for the rest of the spring, summer, and then into Clue at Paper Mill. Um, and that was sort of the plan for the year. Um, what I have been doing is um, a lot of writing. Um, I have a, a, a children's book called Ingredients for a Witch, which um, uh, Jason Simon, uh, my friend, is a wonderful illustrator. And last summer, Ingredients for Spell, the next chapter was supposed to come out. And so uh, we postponed it because we thought, well, how, you know, people don't want mail, people don't want to go shopping, you know, that kind of thing. Well, we'll try it for this year. And then um, uh, I started a program that I call Create Human Animation, where I work with kids on creating original stories and scripts, and then we film them via Zoom, and then I make a video for them. And it's been really fun. I have to say, you know, first of all, I'm learning, you know, editing and adding animation and music and all kinds of stuff. And, uh, you know, we all learned Zoom. Um, and that's been amazing. I've done a couple of, uh, I did a concert for Paper Mill. I did a, I've done a couple of outdoor concerts, things, you know, kind of COVID safe. Um, and I have a really fantastic uh, morning gig where I go to this dog uh sort of dog dog park place um that takes care of dogs during the day and boards dogs and it's this beautiful outdoor space and i just get to cuddle dogs in the morning <laughs> and i just say like i really love it it's it's very zen it's uh it's you know it's like my little church as a matter of fact i've been writing something about it so um i don't know i may have a show out of it we'll see <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome that's great yeah, that's y your quarantine sounds a lot more peaceful, <laughs> peaceful. than others. Yes, absolutely. Um, all right. So, where do you see uh, Broadway, the industry, kind of jumping off from here? Oh, I think it's going to come back with a vengeance. I think, you know, um, I've I've heard through some friends and shows that what's what's been really great, I don't know how long it goes or which show or whatever, but some of the shows have been paying the insurance for a lot of the actors that aren't working. And I think that's amazing, you know, Wicked or Hamilton or, you know, some of these gigantic shows. I mean, if they are doing it, you know, what a great thing because they're gonna come back. I mean, those shows are coming back. I mean, I think Hamilton's announced July 4th, right at this point. Um, but I think everything that had, um, not come in or maybe had had a real box office presence is probably going to come back and i think people are gonna people are not going to be afraid i think they're going to rush back i think the fact that people are you know still running around without masks you know in this in the, in the shape that this country is in because of covid um it's not going to stop them from going to the theater i mean if they're you know doing what they're doing now but before you know everybody gets vaccinated and once people are vaccinated and i think people are chopping it a bit to go back to their normal lives yeah so um you know a, a couple of times i know i i think it was um i think it's st louis the um the muni has announced their summer theater which is outside um but still you know i don't know if you can put twelve thousand people together and you know, what happens to the cast and the orchestra and the stage management and hair and makeup, you know what I mean? So, and, and are you gonna sing, you know, 
our, our is the music man and and marrying the librarian going to sing till there was you in each other's faces or are they going to sing at nine feet apart you know so that's still an issue for the unions to figure out um but honestly i i think once it's back once it's sort of safe to come back people are going to flood the place i think with you know um where the tourists are going to be coming in, which is a big thing of Broadway, you know, after the first six months, you know, everybody's goes to a Broadway show is, is a tourist. You really need the tourist trade. So again, I don't know. I think it may take maybe a spring 2022 for it to come back with a vengeance. I think it'll come back by, by the holidays. Um, but I think probably by the summer of 2022, I, maybe everything will be back to normal. That's my take on it. I don't know. And I know, again, not smart enough to get into Catholic University. So I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> These books, it's all props. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, what advice do you have for young artists and students for this time, you know, amidst the, what, what seems like a never ending dark tunnel, you know, what advice do you have for them to keep going? You know what, I think, um, Brandon, is that you have got to create your own career. I mean, I think if you look, what I always will say to students is, even if you're not a writer, write something, write a cabaret act, you know, write yourself a project, write something that you can, you know, get 50 of your friends to come in and see and, you know, because it, it you know, you never know where it's going to spark or, or who it's going to attract to work on something with you or, or where it's, where it's going to take you. All the people that we admire in show business created their own way, you know, I mean, yes, people have had the doorway of sitcoms or a movie role or, you know, a lot of Broadway, you know, step ups. I mean, but there's a, you know, a lot of people have created their own stuff. Um, and that's what sort of ends up happening. And I think in the trajectory of, of a career, I think, you know, you get your way in and then hopefully you have your prime time and then, you know, careers dwindle a little bit because popularity and whatever, um, where you have to start creating your own projects or aligning yourself with people who do projects, um, you know, and then there's the comeback. <laughs> oh, look, she's got a television show, you know? Um, so I, I think if, you know, even if you don't think you have a voice, you have a voice, you know, and you should, you should use it. You should basically, you know, write, write what you know, write what you want to know, you know, definitely read up and learn things that interest you, especially during this time. I and mean, because we have it, it's, I, I give myself 15 minutes a day to write, you know, to make myself write, because sometimes, you know, the day can get away from you, but really I have nothing else to do. So it's sort of an excuse. Um, so I have tons of projects, <laughs> you know, I mean, that I'm doing either for myself or, you know, for something down the road or, you know, whatever. I, th I think it's important to, you know, put pen to paper, um, maybe a couple, for a couple of minutes a day. Journal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so you have also recorded two incredible solo albums, one in, entitled um, Count the Stars from 2008, and then On Christmas Morning from 2009. You sound great on both of them. So Thank congratulations. You. Um, so what was your inspiration for these albums and what was the process like recording and releasing them? And then where can we find them? And do you plan to do any more in the future? It's funny, I'm actually, I'm actually working on something right now um, with my musical director for um, On Christmas Morning. Um, well, uh, Spotify, they're all on Spotify. They're on iTunes, um, CD Baby, which is a great um, resource for um, artists. Um, for CDs or, you know, for releasing things. Um, now everybody, you know, does things digitally. So um, my, my inspiration was, I, you know, growing up, my, my family and friends were always like, can you make a CD? Can you make a CD? Can you make a CD? And uh, so finally, I think when I got the opportunity to um, 
do a couple of my own solo shows for for places, I thought, oh, uh, uh, the, the gentleman who hired me said you have to have a CD because they like to take something away from the evening and it's a great way to sell, you know, sell you in the future. So I made Count the Stars um, of songs that I just wanted to sing. And the nice thing about it is uh, they, you know, they play it on Sirius, which is great. And they play on Christmas morning as well. On Christmas morning was something um, that I just love Christmas music and I just wanted to do something, you know, whether it was just, you know, for family or friends, but, but that one has been pretty popular. And um, uh, so I'm working on something new right now. It's something a little more towards uh, like a folkier Broadway uh, kind of Celtic way about it. Um, I sang uh, Carrick Fergus, which is a, a Irish song on Boardwalk Empire. And I would get lots of requests from people. Do you have a recording of that from who people watch the show? Because when they released the song on the Boardwalk Empire soundtrack, I sang it a cappella. They had um, uh, Loudon Wainwright record it with music. So they put that on the album. They said to me, we can't release yours because it doesn't have any background music. It's just you singing a cappella. But I get a lot of requests for it, and still to this day. So it's it's a it's up on YouTube, uh, and I was thinking of re recording that with music, um, because I would just give it away. You know, I they gave me my original recording, which was me singing the entire song. They didn't use the entire song for the episode, but I would just send it out, and um, you know, it was it was nice that people were were requesting it. Um, so that's kind of what I'm working on now. Awesome. So just winding down here, uh, what is your favorite show you've done or favorite person you've worked with? It can be any of the above. Oh my gosh, there's so many, so many, right? That, I mean, the producers was amazing. Um, I, uh, you know, I just had a, an incredible time with all those actors and, and the people in that theater. We were, you know, such a great family. Um, I got to play um, Albin in San Francisco at um, a theater out there and in La Cajafo, and that was a really fun role to play. And the Comedy of Tenors, which I've done a couple of times, which I did at the Olney, which is uh, a, a great, fun, romp, uh, crazy play that you know keeps me on my toes, um, which I've loved doing that. And I, I'm just worked with, uh, director Casey Hushin, she's amazing. She's everything. Um, I'm such a huge fan of hers. I love work, working with her because she's so fun and, and nurturing and smart. And um, I think she's a real force um, for musical theater in the future. Um, Brad Oscar, it's my buddy. Uh, I've worked with him in a couple of shows and I would love to work with him again. Uh, he was brilliant in um, something rotten. We still, so the family still talks about that performance. Amazing. He was yeah. amazing. He really was. Um, but he's a great guy. We laugh a lot. And um, I don't know. Love to just love to keep working and you know, <laughs> being being a uh, uh, stupid. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Well, also, you know, along the same lines, is there a favorite story that you have from your career that you would just love to share today? Favorite story? Gosh, like, I, I don't know. Like, I always tell the, my, my audition for the producers, which is um, where I sang Gethsemane from Jesus Christ Superstar, as if I were Max Bialystok. And um, it was a really interesting, uh, so my, my call back, well, first of all, I, I went to the open call for the tour and um, the, the, love, the great Andy Zerman, who is no longer with us, he said, when you come back, you have to sing that song again. I said, when I come back, he said, I'm, I'm calling you back, John. <laughs> when you come back, you have to sing that same song. I said, okay. So when I had my call back, they had uh, they faxed me, because I think that was what we were doing then, 36 pages to learn for my callback. And I was like, oh my God, how am I gonna do this? Let me learn one scene really well for Franz and Max. 
and because they wanted me to sing King of Broadway. There was no way you can learn King of Broadway overnight if you're just if you don't know it at all. I mean, if you'd never heard it really, and I had I don't think I'd I think I'd seen the show and that's it. Um so I sang Gethsemane, the last 20 barns of Gethsemane, and Mel Brooks said, John, we'll see you later, which made me feel like well, that's what he kept saying at the Tony Awards. Every time he won, he goes, we'll see you later. So that means I think I got the job. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that was kind of fun for me. That was one funny thing. And I, and I think another one, I don't know why this pops into my head, but it does. One afternoon, I was making my entrance, I think on stage left, and Liza Minnelli was standing at the stage manager's desk. I thought, my God, there's Liza Minnelli. I did my scene, walked off stage right, and Bette Midler was standing stage right. And I thought, what? what's happening? <laughs> she, had, she had come in to see, I think, you know, Paul Libin on, was the offices were on stage right, and, and Liza happened to come in because she was friends with Sam Harris, and they were on either side of the stage. It was so weird to like enter one side and then exit the other side and be like, you know, they just, it was some afternoon, I think they, they just popped their head in for a minute, but I happened to catch the, that, that moment, but that, that was maybe crack up. And then I guess the day that, the day that George Clooney came to the show to see Richard Kind, and none of the women would go to their dressing room afterwards, they stood on the stairs. It was hysterical. I was walking up the stairs, my dressing room, like, what are you all standing here? <laughs> We're like, you know, George was going to come up and go up the stairs, you know, to Richard's dressing room. And I was like, what? What's where, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> well, that is just an awesome note to end on. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. You know, congratulations on everything. Okay. Uh, you've mentioned your books, your CDs. Is there anything else coming up that you'd just like to promote on here? What else can I sell? <laughs> what do I have on eBay right now? Um, no, but thank you for that. Thank you for mentioning the... Uh, the, the CDs, which, um, yeah, and then Ingredients for Which is at ingredientsforwitch.com. It's adorable. Oh, based off a musical called The Real Wicked Witches of Halloween Hills, written by Robbie Hager, Broadway's Robbie Hager, and myself. And we hope someday you'll see that on Netflix or Warner Brothers Television or something. Awesome. <laughs> it's really cute. Awesome. We put everything in our uh, description on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you guys are fun. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming and stay well and stay in touch. And, you know, we hope to see you on the stage soon. Thank you.